Hello and a very warm welcome to this webinar, The Systemic Change in Energy Taking Advantage of the Developing Smart Charging Ecosystem. I'm sure you'll all agree it's a very catchy title. Essentially, we're going to be discussing the customer propositions that are being developed for electric vehicle drivers, enabling them to charge their cars at a lower cost with greener electricity and in a way that helps rather than hinders balancing of the grid. The webinar today is jointly hosted by Delta EE and EV Energy, and I'm delighted to welcome my Delta colleague and the EV Charging Service Manager, William Vanderbil. Hello, Will. Hi, John, and hi, everyone on, on the webinar. And equally delighted to welcome two colleagues from the Smart Charging Specialists, EV Energy, the CEO and co-founder, Nick Woolley, and Head of Growth, Kathleen McLean. Good morning Hi, to you both. Good morning. So we can hear you loudly and clearly. So the audio is working, so that's great. Now, I'm conscious that we are bringing together two different audiences, some of whom may not be familiar with Delta EE and some may not be familiar with EV Energy. So we're going to start with a quick 30 second elevator pitch on each company. And let's start with EV Energy. So Nick, your 30 seconds. Once I go to the correct slide, start now. So uh, great to be here, John. Thanks for the introduction. So we're EV Energy. We're a software platform that manages electric vehicle charging. Our mission is to deliver simpler, greener, and cheaper electric vehicle charging to every electric vehicle uh, driver out there. Um, what gets me and the team up in the morning is our desire to accelerate the decarbonization of transport and also uh, the decarbonization of the energy system. And we are excited about the role that technology can play in facilitating that transition. Uh, charging is basically the most challenging thing about owning an electric vehicle. The owner needs to find somewhere to recharge and the grid needs to manage uh, demand. And our vision is to deliver a charging experience that makes electric vehicle charging incredibly simple, green and cheap. And on the energy system side, we want to provide the tools in a virtual power plant that allows energy utilities, networks, system operators to be able to manage demand and dispatch that according to their requirements. Um, our software is being used across the world. We've got over 60,000 drivers on the platform. We're working with 20 energy companies in countries like the UK, Australia, Germany, and North America. Thanks, Nick. I'll just take your word that that was 30 seconds. <laughs> and uh, Right, we'll go on to the next slide. So this is just on Delta E. So we are a research and consulting company that is focused entirely on the energy transition. It's all we ever have done, all we ever will do. We provide market insights, customer research, data, forecasts, opinion on developments within the new energy industry. And we focus our work around a number of different topics, those that are on your screens. We deliver the support to clients in two different ways. We have a range of subscription-based research services that provide ongoing programs of content to our subscribers. And we provide bespoke support for clients on a one-to-one -one basis via our consultancy team. Of course, today the webinar is related to EV charging. And so the content that Will and I will be discussing is taken directly from our EV charging service. Hopefully that was about 30 seconds. Uh, okay, some brief housekeeping before we get right into the content. Uh, as always, um, our intention is to speak for or present for about 45 minutes, give or take, with uh, the remaining time, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so please feel free to submit your questions. There should be a box on the right-hand side of your screen where you can ask us a question and we will monitor those during the session and we will make sure that we've got time to cover some of those um, towards the end of the webinar. The webinar is hopefully being recorded in if I press the right button. Um, um, so you can watch the recording back at your leisure afterwards. And we can send the slides out. Uh, I think we will automatically actually send the slides out to all attendees after the session. So that's the housekeeping sorted. Um, brief agenda, we're going to be talking about what is smart charging and why we need it, um, what are the, drive, uh, the driver pain points that can be overcome through the utilisation of smart charging. We will talk about some of the propositions that are being developed for EV drivers and their reactions to those. Um, and Nick and Kathleen will present some of the, the real world case studies that they are working on today. Okay, uh, let's start off with some of the content 
text for why we need EV charging, and Will, you're going to present some of the data from our EV charging service. Thanks, John. So Delta EE and, and the EV charging service has conducted in-depth EV and charge point forecasts for individual countries in Europe, which, when aggregated, provide a full European view. So focusing on, on the EV uptake, and you can see the graph on, on the screen now, that we have forecasted there to be 85 million EVs on European roads by 2030. And this includes battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, and electric light commercial vehicles. And 85 million EVs on, on European roads by 2030 means that we expect the market to grow about 15 times compared to today. So really strong growth over the decade. And there are three key drivers behind the strong growth. The first is policy and regulation. And we've seen numerous countries announce the ban of new sales of ICE vehicles in the future, from Norway and Netherlands announcing 2025 bans to the UK announcing a 2030 ban. The direction of travel from the regulation and policy perspective is, is clear. The second driver is market push from the auto OEMs towards EVs. And we now regularly hearing announcements of auto OEM setting dates to be all electric. I think the most recent one last week was, was Nissan announcing that it won't be investing in Euro 7 compliant pure combustion vehicles. Instead, they will only be introducing new vehicle models, which are all electric on European roads from 2023. And the third and, and final driver for the strong growth is con con consumer demand or customer demand. And despite all the announcement from these auto OEMs, they can't keep pace with consumer demand. And we know that demand for EVs is actually outstripping the supply of EVs with wait times being six months plus. So there are a number of key drivers why, as to why we believe this, this strong growth in, in EVs over the decade. Um, so we have the strong growth in EVs, but these EVs will need to be charged. So we've also produced charge point forecasts for Europe. And as you can see on, on, on the screen now, these um, we expect there to be 45 million charge points installed in Europe by, by 2030. And this includes home charge points, workplace charge points, and public charge points. And this is around 12 times, um, in 2030, the, the number of charge points installed will be about 12 times more than in 2021. So again, really, really strong growth. And I think the key point here is that um, EV uptake and charge point uptake are, are really closely aligned. So those two graphs look look pretty similar. Um, and on, on the next slide, you can see um, that the, the breakdown between the different charging locations. So I mentioned that those 45 million charge points, they include home, workplace, and, workplace and public charge points. Um, and we can see on, on this pie chart that home charge points will account for the majority of those 45 million charge points, accounting for almost three quarters of the installed base by, by 2030. And this shouldn't be a surprise. Home charging is the most convenient and, and cheapest way to charge your EV. Um, so you'd expect it to account for, for the majority of, of charge point installations. So we've got exponential uptake of, of EVs. We've got exponential uptake of charge points across Europe. Well, what does this mean for the increase in, 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 in energy demand? And in short, we expect annual energy demand to increase 33 times from four terawatt hours today to 143 terawatt hours in, in 2030. So a big increase in the, in the annual energy demand due to the electrification of transport. And you can see with those low percentages on, on those pie charts that home charging is the charging location which will contribute the most to this 143 terawatt hours. Um, we expect home charging to, to um, account for around 51 terawatt hours. So more than a third of, of overall energy demand is going to be due to charging at home. And assuming an average price of around 25 cents per kilowatt hour, this will result in annual revenue from electricity sales for, for home charging to be um, 12.8 billion euros. So there's a big opportunity here, especially for, for home charging. Thanks. Well, uh, an important point, I guess, that the, the, the data on this slide is relating to, uh, it's an aggregated total for four, four countries, Germany, UK, France, and the Netherlands, right? Yes, exactly. So if, exactly, it's only four, four out of, four countries out of the whole of Europe. So if you actually aggregate that to the whole of Europe, it's it's going to be significantly bigger. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Will.
Great, thanks. And um, yeah, so just actually thinking about that 33x increase that, that Will's just mentioned, you know, we don't have to really imagine the significant strain that that's going to actually start putting on on our existing infrastructure and you know nick mentioned that we've got over 60,000 people on our platform today and and we're actually already starting to see and experience that on on the ev energy platform so what we wanted to do was just share with you um the graph in front of you right now uh, actually shows one of our ev charging load reports uh, from the platform um so if you actually just look at the left hand side of the screen you know you'll see between five and nine o'clock that's that's basically when we 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 see the most energy demand coming so most people are coming home they're they're plugging their evs in you know they're just about to you know uh think about what you're doing at that time right you're you're plugging your car in you're cooking you're washing you know we're already actually putting a lot of demand on the energy grid at that point so you know ev charging is actually adding even even more towards that strain um, and then, yeah, so actually think about the times when we're not naturally consuming energy as well. So if you look at that time um, between like one o'clock to, to seven o'clock, you know, even even more so 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, that, that that's the perfect time to, to really be plugging in. But, you know, are you actually going to get up and, you know, set an alarm and, and plug your car in at that time? I, I definitely know what my answer would be to that one. Um, and I think I think just adding to this as well, you know, if you think about you know we're talking about the grid strain with respect to you know the current grid that we do have you know we are looking towards a renewable energy future and renewables will be our future but until we can really harness renewable generation and storage at scale we're going to be putting that extra strain on a grid um and and actually if we if we don't manage to do that at scale we're going to be even more dependent on on coal and gas you know as 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 we build this up so so yeah if you if you scroll into the next slide Uh, yeah, we've just taken a look at energy demand, but actually, what about when we match this uh, charging profile to cost? And and naturally, what what we see on our side is that you know energy prices also actually increase when you know the times that we we actually need it most. So uh, again, it's just drawing your attention to the graph here. Uh, 4 p.m. You know that that spikes just straight up. Um, and I think the the question to all of us really is, you know, are you actually really aware of what you pay for your electricity bill? I think you know. If, Actually, this, this call, maybe more people over index of owning an EV. So maybe you do actually, um, you know, you're a bit more aware than the average person. But, you know, overall, people are not that that aware of what they're paying. So, um, yeah, markets are actually favoring the flat rate energy tariffs. You know, most people are actually um, paying one consistent price. And, and ultimately, you know, that that means that we're all living in a world of of mindless energy consumption. Um, you know, consumers are unaware of when those best times are, you know, to support a strained grid or when they'll actually benefit from cheaper prices. So, you know, we have an outstanding question, you know, how do we actually show consumers that choice and how do we make them more aware of, of that flexibility that's actually available to them as well? Thanks, Kathleen. So, uh, great insight and, and charts there. So, if I can just summarise what we have discussed over the first couple of slides. Um, essentially, or, or the, the first sector of this webinar, uh, we, we, we essentially got a four-step problem or challenge. We, we have the exponential increase of electric vehicles and the associated infrastructure, which is putting a significant increase in terms of annual electricity demand, both in terms of kilowatt hours energy and power kilowatts. And so the electricity grid is, there's a real risk that that could be overloaded at certain times if, if all EV drivers are plugging in at the same time. And also, like you were saying, Kathleen, you know, oftentimes, you know, these peak periods are consistent with when peak pricing. Um, so EV drivers potentially paying much more for when they're charging uh, during those evening periods, for example. There's a simple solution to this, and that is to incentivize electric vehicle drivers to charge at non-peak times through smart charging and of course smart charging is what we're here today to discuss so what is smart charging and how can customers benefit i think most folk actually on the webinar will be fairly familiar with what smart charging is so i'm not going to labor this point too much but essentially there are two components to electric vehicle charging which can impact your household's energy bill um, and also power demand so there's the, the speed or the power at which the EV is being charged at any given time, and also the time at which that EV is charged. So there's essentially two variables that you can play around with. You can modulate up and down the power, and you can modulate up and down, or modulate essentially from side to side, I guess, uh, the time when you charge. So when we talk about smart charging, we are 
essentially talking about intelligently controlling one, the speed of the EV charger and or the time at which that EV charger is, is being turned on and off to ensure that we can charge at cheaper or greener times of day and that we don't exceed the maximum available power our houses or the local grid can accommodate. And of course, in some markets, there are peak demand charges. And if you go above a certain threshold, you'll pay much more even within, within your household. There are different use cases, um, and we'll come on to some of these um, shortly. Um, but there, if you can apply price signals or incentives, they can be used to encourage EV drivers to alter their charging behavior and to better support and balance the electricity grid. There are different ways that this can uh, be bundled for propositions. But um, some, some of the most common examples of these are a static time of use tariff. So that is where a customer will pay for uh, a certain price of electricity during the day typically, and then pay a set price, normally a cheaper price, um, overnight during set periods of the day. And it's the same price, price during the night, uh, the same uh, for, for, from day to day. Um, then there's a, another type of time of use tariff, dynamic time of use tariffs, which are more closely linked to, for example, wholesale electricity prices, where the price that uh, a driver is paying uh, can fluctuate um, even hourly or half hourly, depending on wholesale market prices. And then a third example is what we, you might refer to as a type of use proposition, and that is where perhaps an EV driver is paying a different price for when they charge their car, um, versus the, the price that they're paying for um, providing power to their domestic energy appliances like their, their light, lighting and um, cooking and things like that. And I think Nick's going to present an example of a time of use tariff or proposition that they've, they've been developing together with one of their partners. Um, let's look at, at what's happening across certain markets in Europe. Um, we've been looking at what the energy retailers are providing to their customers. And actually, one observation is that um, generally they've been quite slow to offer EV specific tariffs. These are tariffs that are designed specifically for customers that have electric vehicles. And despite the, the, the boom that we've seen over the last two or three years with electric vehicles across Europe, there are actually still a relatively small number of tariffs specifically targeted at EV drivers that have been launched. The, the map shows you um, just some of the, the, the uh, most advanced uh, Western European markets for electric vehicles. The numbers on those maps refer to the, the total number of electric vehicles, cars. Um, this is uh, battery electric vehicles, so fully electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids in each market at the end of last year, 2021. And the, the colors of each country is associated to the number of specific EV tariffs that are available within each country during the course of last year. In the UK, there's um, quite a relatively advanced market, over 15 dedicated EV tariffs. But in some of the other markets like France and Spain and Italy, um, there are far fewer propositions that are actually targeted at EV drivers. So there's still a bit more work to do, I think, in providing these propositions to EV drivers. Um, this next slide is presenting some of the customer research that we've gathered over the last uh, three years, where we've been surveying existing EV drivers and asking them about the type of tariff that they have. The chart on the left-hand side tells us that only 21% of existing EV drivers are on an EV-specific tariff. And then the right-hand side is telling us um, that almost half of EV drivers are not on a time of use tariff. So 13% on a dynamic time of use tariff, where you've got that variable pricing from hour to hour, potentially. Um, and then a further 41% are on the static time of use tariff, um, a much more common way where people are play, um, paying um, a cheaper price typically overnight. So why has the adoption been slow to date? Well, there are several reasons, frankly, for this. Um, and one of those, of course, is that even though there's been a, a huge growth um, in the annual sales of new cars that are electrified, EVs actually still represent um, a very small part of the overall market in Europe. And um, we're still in sort of the, the single digits percentage wise, um, maybe three, four, five percent in um, some of the, the, the leading Western European markets. Um, of course, that's growing quickly, but um, you know, th those cars, those vehicles still represent a fairly small prize um, today. Of course, that's going to change um, quite a lot in the next few years. It's time consuming and expensive to set up a new tariff. 
especially if these uh, incumbent energy supply suppliers have legacy back-end systems. In certain markets, Germany, for example, um, the, the, the smart meter rollout is still ongoing. Um, and unless you've got smart meters, that can be a hindrance in terms of being able to offer certain time of use tariffs, which rely on that smart meter data. And then we're all very familiar with what's happening with the current energy crisis um, and the, the, the high bills that energy customers are facing and will face over the next months. And of course, you know, that has taken a lot of the, the focus around the propositions that have been developed, not targeting necessarily EV drivers, but helping customers on lower income to, to make sure that they're not overly exposed to rising energy costs. Coming just to, to time of use tariffs, um, and of course, time of use tariffs are designed fundamentally to help customers save money. Um, and just to, just to describe typically how they're made up, they typically have higher peak prices for those periods during the day and then lower off-peak prices compared to those conventional um, flat tariffs. So really to maximize the benefit of time of use tariffs, the usage and the power consumption needs to be managed to reduce exposure to those peak prices and to maximize the benefit of cheaper prices during those off-peak periods. So as long as we can successfully manage that load and um, prevent customers from being too exposed to peak prices and more exposed to off-peak prices, that's great. But there are a couple of incumbent risks here. And one of those is that if households are not managing their usage, then they could be faced with higher bills. And so there's, there's a real journey that um, customers need to go on to, to communicate the benefits of time of use tariffs and to make sure that behavior is changed accordingly. But if that doesn't happen, then there's an incumbent risk on the energy retailers um, that are offering time of use tariffs to their customers. Um, you know, if suddenly their customers are finding that they are exposed to higher prices because they're not changing their, their behavior, their consumption habits, then that could potentially risk the brand, lower their retention rates. Um, and so you know, there is definitely that kind of incumbent risk on energy retailers. So what are some of the ways that we can overcome those risks, overcome those challenges, make these propositions clear and understandable for EV drivers. Well, that's what we're going to discuss, I guess, in, in the next section. Thanks, John. Oh. So um, we wanted to frame this section around some of the solutions that can be deployed to address some of the challenges that uh, John's been describing. So we think there's three core uh, key components to be able to extract value from smart charging and make it work for both consumers and then also for the energy system. So firstly, we need some level of technology. We need to make electric vehicle charging smart. We need to be able to aggregate and optimize electric vehicles. We need to be able to um, provide a customer interface so customers understand what's going on with their electric vehicle charging, but they can still charge their electric vehicle, which is the fundamental pain point that they have when they uh, come home and plug in their electric vehicle. And on the energy system side, what we need is we need platforms to be able to optimize against the requirements that the various different actors within the energy system have. So whether that be an energy network, whether that be an energy retailer or a system operator, um, we need to be able to aggregate and optimize those assets as one virtual power plant to be able to dispatch according to their requirements. The second thing we need is the right regulation. And actually the UK is leading the way, I think, in, in, in this field. Um, we have the UK smart charging regulations that are coming in in June later this year, and then they're going to be upped again in, in December. And, and what they will mean is that every single electric charge point that's going in in people's homes will have to be smart, but then also smart and responding to the requirements of the grid in real time. Now, that's pretty good because that means there's a standard that has to be hit. Um, and that means that we will necessarily be able to rely on those charges to be able to create value for the energy system and for end consumers. And then lastly, we, also, we just need to get the message out there to, to consumers about the benefits of doing the right thing for the grid. We believe that smart charging and the technology associated with it should be, um, should be basically as simple as doing a standard charge. And you should, as an end consumer, you should not have to worry about it on a day-to-day -day basis. And we need, to, we need to get the message out from vehicles like Fully Charged to uh, talk about why owning an electric vehicle is straightforward and why charging can be straightforward and why smart charging is the right thing to do for the energy system and the grid. So they're the, they're the ingredients. And then on the next slide, I just wanted to talk through perhaps some uh, key examples. Uh, so we've got four examples here of 
projects that we've been working on across the uh, across the world that touch on some of the aspects that have been teed up uh, in the front section of the webinar. So first of all, we're going to just talk to you about an example in Germany um, with Volkswagen and the tourist from Connect, um, where they're using smart charging rewards to incentivize the customer to charge at the right points in time. And it's a type of use tariff that gives cash back on energy bills. We're also going to talk about E.ON in the UK and how that's um, automatically shifting load to the right points in time. We're going to talk about Silicon Valley Clean Energy in California to align electric vehicle charging with the availability of solar energy that's generated on the Californian grid. And then lastly, we'll talk about some of the more technical examples around demand response and how it can work for the system operator and, and, and network operators like the UK Power Networks in the UK. So on the next slide, um, Here's an example from Germany with Volkswagen Naturals from Connect. So we've been working with Ellie to develop a, a smart charging proposition that is now launched and live in the market. It's called Volkswagen Naturals from Connect. It is an energy tariff. And as John mentioned, in, in Germany, there are there's not that many smart meters at all. So everything that you're having to do, you have to do around a an energy market that doesn't have any uh, smart meters. And so um, what this what the tariff and the proposition is is a type of use rate so it gives uh, as a driver you're incentivized for, for coming home and plugging in your electric vehicle um, you earn money back on your energy bill simply by plugging in and charging and in the background what's happening is um, the system is optimizing that electric vehicle charging to move away from coal uh, and gas generation on the german grid and move that towards renewable assets and the availability of those renewable assets so from an end consumer perspective there's no trade-offs you just earn money back on your energy bill every single time you charge you don't have to worry about a time of use rate that's penalizing you for putting your oven on at peak times as an energy company you get the full access to um, the ability to control and manage electric vehicle charging um, through uh, through the vehicle actually in this case um, and that's awesome because you can tune that electric vehicle charging for the best times for the grid uh, and then you have full control to trade and retrade that energy as you see fit. And it means that you're not locked to a specific time to charge that electric vehicle and you can flex that day in, day out, depending on the, the background conditions that are existent on the, on the energy grid. On the, on the next slide, we've got another example from um, uh, the UK market. So this is uh, E.ON Next Drive. So E.ON uh, Next Drive uh, is a smart charging proposition in the UK. Um, and what this product does is it delivers automatic uh, smart charging. So drivers enroll on the tariff and then their charging is automatically shifted for times when the price is cheapest. So like the Volkswagen tariff, it's, uh, it's not a time of use rate. Um, it's actually um, it actually applies to the electric vehicle only. And the incentives apply to you shifting your electric vehicle charging to certain times. Um, I think the timings are between midnight 30 and uh, 4.30 in the morning. Um, it's quite innovative, like the Volkswagen uh, product in terms of it doesn't require a smart meter. The incentive is applied by, by observing what's happening with the electric vehicle charging behavior and then crediting back onto the energy bill. Um, and that means it can be rolled out to every uh, customer in the UK, even those who have potentially opted out of having a smart meter or maybe can't get the connectivity. Um, and the great thing about it is it's automatic. So the customer just comes home, they plug in, and their, uh, their, their load is automatically shifted to the off-peak periods. And as a result, what they can get is quite significant savings. So you can save around £250 per year against the background uh, 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 rate of electricity, uh, which is pretty huge in this, in this environment where energy prices are rising, um, rising it seems, <laughs> on a one-way ticket to rise. Um, and on the slide, what you can see is on the left-hand side, what um, would have happened without uh, this product. And then on the right-hand side, what actually happened. So as Kathleen was describing before, on the left-hand side, you can see that the data shows that basically all the charging would have occurred in the early evening, and there would have been a massive peak on the grid. And on the right-hand side, you can see that there's virtually no charging occurring uh, um, during those times. It's all shifted to the off-peak times when there's more wind available and the grid's less stressed. And so that's great for the grid and the energy system. On the next slide, another example from California. This is about. I was just, I just going to ask a question actually, Nick. So, so you mentioned yes. that the, 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 it's not a, it's not a time of use tariff exactly. Uh, that this Eon one, but the, but the customer is paying less for charging. You know, it, yeah. it's, all, it's all automated. They're paying less during those kind of midnight to four thirty in the morning. 
Um, so the, the pain less during that period, and I guess Eon is the one that in the background is is getting less exposure to those prices and uh, is working with their back end system to make sure that they themselves, Eon, are less exposed to the prices that they, they've got and the cost that they've got for servicing those customers. Yes, exactly. So um, it's genuine. It is it is a benefit for the energy company to obviously shift the electric vehicle load to those points in time. The electric vehicle asset is a truly flexible asset within the home, and by buying energy at those off-peak times, typically it is is around 3 a.m. 2 a.m. That's the cheapest wholesale market price. You can then um, you can then reduce the cost to serve those electric vehicle customers uh, with the rollout of uh, half-hourly settlement. And in the background, yeah, you're exactly right. What's happening is we're measuring, we're observing what's happening with the electric vehicle load. Um, and then there's, there's credits being applied back on the bill that then appear in the app and that then give the customer an engaging experience. Um, and it's it's very much a carrot approach rather than a stick approach, like with the time of use rate, where you're incentivizing the customer to smart charge on a daily basis and they just get credits back on the bill, which feel great. Yeah. Cool. And then another example, so third example around renewables integration. So one of the great things about smart charging is it can be tailored to align with the availability of renewables on the grid. So in California, there's a lot of solar energy that's available on the grid that um, might occur, might be available during the day, um, as well as overnight, there might be wind uh, available. Uh, and so um, what S Silicon Valley Clean Energy have asked us to do and, and, and launched um, is tying electric vehicle charging with the availability of renewable energy on the grid. Um, so the, this is quite interesting because it's actually a be behavioral demand response program uh, as well as an automatic uh, demand response program. So what happens is customers um, customers are uh, out doing their daily business on a, on, a, on a typical day and they get a notification through on the app that tells them that today is a particularly good day to charge their electric vehicle and they get notified of a, what's called a low carbon event. They then plug in during the early evening um, and then their charging is automatically redispatched to align with the availability of low carbon generation on the grid. And then as a result, the customers get uh, credits back on their, on their energy bill um, where they can uh, they get additional incentives above and beyond the time of use rates that exist within California for aligning their charging uh, with the availability of renewable energy. Um, and so this is great for customers, but it's also great for Silicon Valley Clean Energy because they can then make better use of that renewable energy that they're partnering with in their local service territory and, and integrate those two things uh, much more actively. And of course, customers really like that as well because there's nothing better than putting zero carbon electrons into your electric vehicle on a daily basis. And then perhaps a final example on the next slide is um, from a network perspective, how we're working with National Grid and UKPN to automatically manage electric vehicle um, load. Um, so we work with distribution networks and we also work with uh, system operators. Um, so distribution networks typically want a capacity style service, so at a low voltage level, typically what they want to do is they want to release capacity at peak times and they want to avoid all of the electric vehicles charging at peak uh, and overloading the low voltage electricity uh, grid. And so what we do is we ensure that that charging is shifted outside of those periods uh, to the off peak time. Um, National Grid have a slightly different requirement, which is that they want the ability to flex up and flex down load according to the requirements that are happening on the grid. So for example, there could be a sudden uh, surge of renewables on the grid that was perhaps unexpected. Perhaps a weather front came into the UK faster than we expected, and that meant that the wind energy was available more, more, uh, more quickly than we expected, or vice versa, that it was more slow and there was less wind available. Um, or a, a power station trips out, for example. And, and what, what both of these partners do is they tap into the virtual power plant, which you can see on the slide, which provides um, the ability for uh, uh, network operators to turn up and turn down load. Um, at different points in time. Uh, they send us a signal for what they want to do, and then we redispatch and shape the electric uh, vehicle load according to their requirements. And you can see on the graph that you've actually got the ability to ramp up and ramp down load. So smart charging is obviously just pausing and delaying charging to the right points in time. But instead of, if you want to, instead of pausing charging, if you turn up load, you can effectively, uh, you can effectively act as a, a source of demand and then the opposite way around as a, as a source of generation on the grid that can deliver uh, both sets of services to, to grid operators. 
And this can be done right down to the individual vehicle level, so we can customise this into local into local areas as well, which is very handy if you're worried about congestion in a particular location. For example, in the US, um, New York was often quoted as a, a really a congested area of the electricity grid, understandably, because it's difficult to run cables there, uh, and we can provide targeted uh, response and uh, support there. And, and just to give a sense, Nick, of the sort of the, the response times here, uh, and maybe the you know the, the x-axis on that chart, are we talking uh, seconds, minutes, fractions of seconds? Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, generally, we can respond. Electric vehicle load can respond within seconds. It's typically around 10 to 20 seconds that you can respond within, um, and then because we're as a, cent as a centrally controlled devices, um, you're reliant on communications infrastructure to be able to send those messages back down to cars and then to, then to, uh, to switch off. So that's the kind of level of response time. So it's, it's pretty fast, which means it means you can do everything other than the very fastest, uh, say, frequency response services um, from a, a centrally controlled block of, of VPP load. And that means you can do balancing services within the last half hour. You can do retrading, obviously. You can do wholesale market capacity services. Um, there's a lot you can do. You can do reserve style services on the grid as well. Yeah, cool. And, and I've just seen a question that's come in and it's, a, it's around providing flexibility to the grid. Um, how are vehicles able to turn up generation if they're not doing, if they're doing smart charging and not V2G? Um, and of course, V2G is, is the term that's used to provide your know, vehicle back to the grid. So where you're actually discharging the battery back to the home. And of course, this is yeah. essentially whereby if you turn off a charger, you're not necessarily, if it's a V1G, so it's just a unidirectional charger, you're not actually sending power back to the grid, but you're essentially providing more generation capacity back to the grid by turning down the charger. So you, you're, you're decreasing your demand, right? Yeah, right. So you have to think about this. It's <coughs> V2, so V2G is easier to think about because there's a physical flow of energy that can go both ways. So that's nice and straightforward. You can both export and import power at different points in time. With smart charging, you can do the same effect because if you always think that the national grid and system operators are balancing the electricity system for a certain operating point. So they're expecting a certain level of supply and demand to match at a certain point in time. And so if you uh, if you say, well, I'm going to charge my electric vehicle at this point in time, um, but then you decide not to charge your electric vehicle, you're effectively releasing capacity onto the you're releasing capacity versus that operating point onto the grid. Uh, and the same can be true in the other way around, um, where you can uh, increase increase demand on the electricity grid as well. And say I was going to pause my electric vehicle charging, now I'm going to turn it on, and I'm going to increase demand on the grid. So it's always relative to that operating point that you're operating. So you can still effectively provide two-way flows from even pausing charging. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Nick. And some, some great real world case studies there, which I think really kind of bring this whole topic to life. Um, and, and so th thanks for sharing those those charts and insights. This is, is really valuable. Um, Let's go on to the next part. Uh, yeah, so are, are EV drivers happy to, to adopt smart charging solutions? Um, yes, yeah, so um, some work we, the, the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, the, the, the work that we've been doing, um, one of the good case studies that we've done on this topic was uh, Project Shift with UKPN. Um, and there was a, a, a bunch of customer surveys uh, done through that project around uh, electric vehicle drivers and how happy uh, they were to participate. Um, and so some of the insights there were 75% were quite happy or very happy with the idea of a third party managing uh, their electric vehicles charging. I think that's caveated on there being some benefit to that electric vehicle charging, which is it's greener, it's cheaper, and it doesn't affect my ability to drive my electric vehicle uh, the next day. Um, even, even more so, like 85% of participants would trust their DNO to act uh, in an emergency on the grid as well. So this uh, idea that there was some specific contingency on the grid and that there was a need to intervene, 85% um, of participants would trust their DNO to act. And there are some very specific examples that we're discussing all the time about this. For example, wildfires in California, the ability to be able to charge electric vehicles preemptively ahead of a wildfire hitting your local area so that then it could be curtailed in the event that the wildfire gets too close, for example. Um, customers would also like their service provider 
um, to help them to save money too. It's complicated the energy market and recommendations um, uh, recommendations are important. All of this is around a framework where customers need the ability to be able to opt out of smart charging. They don't do it very often, but um, they need the ability to be able to be in control. And so that if if there was some particular event that you needed to get to at 2 a.m. in the morning, you can override your charging. Or if, as what usually happens with me is I get into work and then my wife rings me and says she needs uh, the car ready uh, later in the day, I can boost the car and opt out of smart charging at that point in time. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. So, yeah, Nick, Nick's really described nicely that, that EV drivers are are happy to adopt smart charging um, and we have from our customer research for Europe also asked customers about um, the appeal of smart charging linked with the understanding of smart charging and, and what this graph is showing you is that the greater the customer understands smart charging or the more they understand about smart charging the greater appeal of it so you can see quite a nice little trend line in the middle of this graph which shows that the level of understanding and level of appeal um, go hand in hand. And what this means, I think the, the two key points here is, is firstly that the more customers understand about smart charging, the more they they like it, the more they, they want to, to participate in smart charging. Um, and the second one, the second key point is that um, smart charging is, is, as Nick said, it's, it's quite complicated. It's not easy to, to understand for everyone. Um, these are also early adopters um, EV drivers, as we get more mass market, it's going to become even harder to, to, to understand. Um, so the smart charging service provider or the utility really needs to take the customer on the journey, on the smart charging journey with them and help them understand smart charging as much as possible, because that will result in the customer being more open to smart charging. And the, the energy industry, I think, to date has not been great with trying to be customer centric and, and putting the customer at the heart of of the energy transition, but this graph um, and our customer research shows that there's a there's massive benefit to being customer centric and and taking the customer along the journey with you. Thanks, Will. Yeah, and so, so uh, uh, building, yeah, building building on uh, what Will's just described. Um, uh, it's a bit it's a bit cheesy, but we talk a lot about EV energy. Of um, actually, smart charging can be what we took, we say a win win win, um, because I think firstly we want uh, smart charging to be a win for electric vehicle drivers. We have we have to make this process simple uh, so that drivers can just plug in. Uh, but there is the opportunity for drivers to get incentivized claim rewards, get discounts on their energy bill. And then hopefully that makes them happy to adopt smart charging as Will describes, they learn more about it. Um, but then it can also, secondly, be a win for energy utilities. If we aggregate all of those resources together and we create this virtual power plan um, that allows utilities to be able to control these devices. This, this is the first truly flexible device that you've got within the home. And it is effectively, it's the amount of demand associated with an electric vehicle is equivalent to another home and it's entirely controllable. And so networks can control it, system operators can control it, energy retailers control it. And that means that their costs of serving that energy can go down. And then lastly, obviously, if we do both of those things, if we get the driver propositions working, if we get energy utilities reducing the cost to serve, that will also mean that we're necessarily aligning electric vehicle charging with the availability of renewable energy on the grid, and that can accelerate decarbonisation. And this is like a, a virtuous flywheel because the more we create value on the energy side, the better the consumer offer can be, and therefore the more impact we can have on decarbonizing our energy system. Thanks very much, Nick. I think <clears throat> that, that's a great way to sort of summarize you know, the, 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 this whole topic and actually the, you know, the, the benefits um, for you know, the, the entire value chain for, from from the energy retailers through to through to the end customer and, and the networks in between. So that is the the end of the content that we've got. Um, and actually, I think we're doing pretty well in terms of sticking to the time. We're we're 45 minutes in, so we've got um, you know about 15 minutes left for for Q and A. We'll, we'll we'll finish before the hour. 
Um, so thank you to the presenters. Um, I've been monitoring the questions, but uh, and there's, there's several that have come in already. Um, but please do feel uh, do add any more questions um, during the next ten or so minutes. But let's we've got a few that are coming in. But one is how do you control the speed of charging? So can it be controlled via the the EV, or does it require integration with the charger? And I think that's actually a, a great question. It's something that we looked at at Delta E um, a few years ago uh, in something that we kind of termed the, the three different architectures or archetypes for smart charging. And essentially, it's not one size fits all when it comes to you know where the control comes from and where the intelligence lies. So you can there are certainly some examples where the the intelligence and the control lies within the vehicle itself. So some vehicles which are communicating directly with third-party platforms, uh, aggregators uh, of these EV loads that are then you know, um, helping to balance the system. But equally, there's there's smart chargers, so the hardware um, which is communicating uh, you know, with, with the cloud. Um, and also, um, slightly more niche, but potentially a big opportunity in the future is around where the intelligence lies within the home. So within a home energy management system, and particularly when you're perhaps when you've got solar. And you're monitoring the the generation of solar and optimizing the on-site consumption of that solar, so flexing up and down the the, the charger of the electric vehicle to maximize the on-site consumption of that solar char uh, that, that solar generation, for example. So uh, it's a great question. Where where does the control sit? Well, it, it can be different options, different architectures, depending on the different platforms that are being provided. It could be the charger, could be the car, could be the home. Of those, of those three, Nick, Kathleen, uh, do you see any of those that have particular uh, pathways to 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 winning out in the end, or or do you think there's there's a place for for all three of those? All three. Yeah, I yeah. I, I think we do think there is a place for all three. Um, there are. It it is a very it's a complicated mix. You can control charging at either end of the charging cable. Um, chargers often have the ability to ramp up and ramp down the, the, the amps. Um, most vehicles at the moment don't have, but some vehicles do now. So like Tesla with the latest software, they do. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's there's a role, I think, for all of them. Um, certainly the more integration that you can have with all of those different devices, the more robustness you can have across a system that's delivering something like smart charging as well. I think just to add as well, actually, you give a better customer experience as well by having both integrations. So what we see is we we actually benefit from being integrated to both car and charger, um, because it not only benefits us to be able to have more accuracy, but it helps you know the the customer also have that more control. Thanks, guys. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in that are relating more to the topic of V2G. Um, I think most of what we talked about during the session is is V1G, so unidirectional smart charging and, and flex up and down uh, the, the the timing of of when you're turning on and off a smart charger. But the the, the V2G questions, um, how do you incentivize customers to participate in V2G? I assume the cost savings are not that compelling value. So so what's the value proposition? And then a second question is around, yeah, what's the economic impact of V2G? V2G chargers. So I guess this is um, in relation to you know the higher capex cost for a V2G charger versus kind of a, a conventional V1G charger. Will, Will, do you want to say a few words on this first of all? Yeah, I think two points which come to mind with with that question is, as you mentioned, John, that the the capital cost of a V2G charger is much higher than a than a smart charger. So your payback period is going to be longer. Um, we know V2G is still niche and, and emerging so we do expect that that cost of the charger to decrease over time and then the, the second point around how to incentivize users where the economic benefit might not be substantial um, two thoughts on that is firstly i think that the economic incentive will, will increase throughout the decade as we've got um as we get more more electrification of transport and heat and more renewables so balancing that supply and demand is going to become increasingly tougher and, and more important. Um, and then the second point is, is around the user experience and trying to make it as easy as possible for the user to participate in providing smart charging or, or V2G. And if it's all done in the background without the user having to, to actually do anything and there's no impact on their mobility, 
why wouldn't they um, provide their, why wouldn't they, they, they provide V2G or V1G services? Um, they will get rewarded and there's no skin off their back. So um, yeah, I think the customer experience is, is, is something that, that needs to be focused on. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Will. I, we see, you know, the, the customer experience that we're delivering for smart charging today, we think could be very similar for a V2G uh, scenario. Uh, the user needs to be able to come home, plug in their car, and then have their car ready for the time at which they want to drive their car. It can discharge during that period. It doesn't really matter, but they need to have it ready for that period. And that's what smart charging can deliver as an experience today. There are massive advantages, though, if we could export power back onto the grid. But as you say, it's, it's about the, the economics of the assets, plus also the wear and tear on the batteries themselves as to whether or not that will uh, when it will pencil out, I think. Yeah. And, and just to add as well, that, that's something that we spend a lot of time at EV Energy doing is what is that incentive? How do you deliver that incentive? At what time? You know, and and I think that that is really key uh, to making sure we we get people involved um, and, and make them care. We've got lots of good questions coming in. So thanks very much for that. Uh, a particularly good question, I think, has come in. Uh, let me just read it out. So the, the grid is subjected to critical critical conditions due to high demand of residential home charging activities between 5 and 9 p.m. But when we have many residential chargers operating during the off-peak periods, won't this then be considered another on-peak period? So I guess if we shift all the charging from on-peak to off-peak, does that then create another peak at some other time of day? Do you want me to take that, John? Nick, yeah, you, you start with that one because it, it's, it's a great question and I'm sure you've got a good, a good response to that. Yeah, I mean, it is a, it is a great question. And uh, we do need to make sure we don't shoot ourselves in the foot on this one. Um, so. If you look, uh, a, good, a good international example on this is uh, California, actually, where there's lots of time of use rates and people are, are doing, they're not doing smart, automatically controlled smart charging, they're just doing timer-led smart charging. And what's actually happening on the grid is you're getting this massive secondary peak that's actually exceeding uh, the peak at um, uh, in the early evening. And it, the problem with the peak as well is it's a, it's a very spike and then it rolls off because everybody sets their timers for the off-peak uh, off period. So obviously a better solution to that is to then dynamically manage uh, electric vehicle charging and respond in real time and then diversify that electric vehicle charging. And if you saw the graph from Eon, that's real data where you can see that um, you can see that the load is actually spread out. So there's no secondary peak, it's all spread out over, uh, over that period. So, that, so that's one thing. And then the other the other part of the question is like, well, won't we just overload the grid if we just shift the peak? I mean, ultimately, this is a, a physics question, right? We, we have a, a pipe and it has a certain capacity. And at some point, even if we smooth out that demand entirely, we need to build bigger pipes. So at some point, you just you do need to just upgrade the network. But the opportunity for us is to is to manage that demand and reshape load away from this in the UK, this very heavy early evening peak and reshape that to off peak periods and flatten out as best as we possibly can until the point at which we need to uh, upgrade the networks. Ultimately, um, at some point, you will just need to increase capacity on the grid. It's, it's actually one reason why V2G uh, may also not be that beneficial because ultimately, if you're still required, if, you, if you've leveled out that demand entirely, it doesn't matter whether I can export or import, I just need to upgrade the, the overall capacity at some point. Yeah. Just to just to finish on that as well, I'm right in saying that even with our technology, we'll never really have a second peak. It's, it's actually not that possible because basically we're always optimizing away from any strain. Yeah, you you won't have a you won't have a secondary peak that occurs at a specific point in time, mm -hmm. but yeah, at some point you would just the, the network runs out of capacity and once yeah. it's smoothed out entirely, there's nothing more, unfortunately, smart charging can do. It's not magic. Yeah. And it's one of the things that the, the uh, I mean, the, the, the markets are always evolving, the technology is evolving, the regulations are also evolving to, to, to start, try and accommodate the, these challenges. And um, one of the things that uh, in the UK, for example, with the, with the, uh, the new smart charging regulations that are being rolled out is, is actually uh, related to that, but also if you're, you know, um, if you've got an off-peak period which sort of kicks in at say one in the morning, uh, even that you've got a very low kind of demand period during the day, 
that if you had all the EVs, even even if they don't exceed the overall kind of limit of, of peak during the kind of the, the evening period, but if they were all to sort of switch on at the, the exact instantaneous period of time, then that could, you know, from, from a uh, just like a switch on point of view, could put that instantaneous strain on the grid, which could, um, you know, from a frequency point of view, could uh, could uh, topple over the grid potentially. So the, one of the, the the rules that that new smart charging regulation in the UK is bringing in is that for these smart chargers, essentially, I think it's over a course of 10 minutes that actually the, the, the charger will come on at some point during that 10 minute period. So even though if it's scheduled to come on at one in the morning, it may actually come on at five minutes past or eight minutes past or two minutes past. So all of those charges which are, are scheduled to come on at one in the morning, for example, will then actually come on over the period of that 10 minutes. So they're not all being switched on at the exact same time. So there are regulations that are coming in which are trying to prevent these sort of these load moments or these switch on moments, which are you know putting these these great you know very short periods of strain, but you know very big potentially strains. Um, and try to smooth out those, that, that bumpy ride, which you know, the, the smart charging could potentially have. So it's all about smoothing those peaks, isn't it? And making it as flat and manageable as possible. Um, right, uh, let's try and get through one or two more questions. Uh, have any of you guys seen one? There's there so many I could choose, but are there, are there any other that are teed up? I'm just scrolling through as we go. Um, let's finish on a good one. Or a really good one. <laughs> the, the, there's one here. Um, it's it's, it's uh, for you guys, Nick, Kathleen, um, which I saw earlier. I can't find it again, but it's related to the fact that we've talked a lot about um, B2C, um, so residential customers. But to what extent yeah. are you also active in, in targeting B2B customers, fleets, businesses, that sort of thing? Uh, happy to take that one quickly. Yeah, so there is a big opportunity from a, a fleet perspective as well. I mean, a lot of a lot of fleets, as we know, will be returned to home fleets. Uh, and so where the car is left for a long period of time, they don't even have to be at home. They could be on street as well. We should also say on street is a great place to do stuff like smart charging too. Um, where, the, where the vehicle is left for a long period of time, then that fleet uh, can be optimized in exactly the same way. And what that does is that helps the fleet manager to who is often picking up the energy bill associated with recharging all of these electric vehicles, whether they be at home or off um, or outside the home too, uh, they can then significantly reduce the energy costs um, to um, uh, to charge those electric vehicles. And one of the things we can obviously do is we can mandate that um, a fleet driver who might not be that incentivized themselves to to do smart charging has to do smart charging on a daily basis and so when they come home and plug in at home and they have the opportunity to do smart charging we optimize for their off-peak rate and we save the fleet manager uh, significant money for doing that i think another point on that b2b and fleets is that fleets or a large proportion of fleets also have set utilization rates so it's a lot easier to optimize the charging because you know exactly when that vehicle or that battery is going to be available for for smart charging indeed Thanks, thanks for that, Will. Um, and we're we're out of time. Uh, we're top of the hour, so we said we'd stick within the hour. So, thank you uh, very much, Nick and Kathleen, for joining us. Thank you, Will, as well. Um, and thank you to all of you for for dialing in and listening. I hope it's been an interesting session. Um, so, yeah, thanks for attendance, and uh, yeah, wishing you a great rest of the day and the week. Thanks for joining, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.